Yes, guys, welcome back to the Canon Podcast. How are you? I hope you're doing very, very well. We've just done a full rewatch of the first half of the Manchester United game from the preseason tour in the US, which you can go check out for free uh, from the link in the description on the Patreon and YouTube member side. Um, we were going to do a Liverpool match, but for some reason that's not available in the UK. I, d I don't know why. Um, we're a UK-based club last time I checked, so I don't, I don't really don't understand that. But anyway, um, but we're here to talk sort of tactically what we learned from the pre-season, uh, the pre-season tour in the US, which is now over. How sad. Um, we want to talk Wanyeri and Miles and sort of how Hayland sort of fits in over the course of the season. We want to talk Jesus at right wing. We want to talk the central access, switches and so on and forth. Um, let's get into it. Um, Ethan. Ethan and Miles, your boys. <laughs> they look pretty impressive. They look pretty impressive. Um, I uh, want to start off with something, a uh, sort of thought I've had. In terms of the usage of Ethan this year, there's a lot of interest and a lot, obviously, a lot of um, hype around him and, and that sort of stuff. I want to get your take on sort of how much you see him being used this year, where you see him being used this year. I was really impressed by him in preseason and sort of the, 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 the appearances that he did have. In terms of his usage, of space around the box. I really like him close to the box. Obviously, we saw the assist in, in the Manchester United game, but also in the Bournemouth game. The bravery, um, his willingness to take people on. There's a moment in the Bournemouth game where he's like, he's back to goal in our half and manages to wriggle out of space and sort of carry right the way up the wing and then produce a sort of slip pass to, to Nketiah, which is really nice. There's a bravery and intensity to the way he plays, but also the sort of the ghosting in sort of on the blind side of the centre back and the and the right back and all that sort of stuff. I, I really like that. All of this to say, in terms of the two players, obviously we have in the moment with Erdegaard and Rice uh, in the midfield, probably the pillars, the the, the the two midfielders that aren't likely to move. Is there a position here, and we have got Marino coming in, so we need to consider that, where Ethan is is a really good compliment. Someone who, with Erdegaard dropping outside the block and more sort of a knitter, obviously Rice behind behind play, doing a bit more breaking up and sort of progressing. Someone who is going to be that sort of central midfielder who is a bit further up. Someone who can receive in the block. Someone who can make things happen around the box. Someone who's going to shoot as well. Someone who's sort of more willing to do that and that kind of youthful exuberance. There's a sort of picture forming for me, and I don't know how Marino fits in with it, that Miles, uh, sorry, Ethan, could have a pretty big role because he fits in with those two quite well, in my head, certainly. And I want to get your, your sort of take on that. It's difficult, right? Because you're asking him to do that on the left. He can do it. Um, it's not something where he's most effective. And um, I think that with him, he'll he'll have opportunity to show. And I think even the United rewatch that we saw, he's just incredibly intelligent. Like he understands uh, where he needs to be to exploit space. Like ultimately, so w w again, whether he's left wing, right wing, false nine, insert your favorite tactical dream here. He, he can find space in the telephone booth. He's that type of player, right? It's that classic narrative. So for me, I think he'll be effective everywhere. Will you get the best out of him as the final eight in a three that's pushed high on the left? I don't think so. I think he's a little bit more of an all phase midfielder, somebody that, you know, you don't want set to one third really the Martin Odegaard successor in, in in many ways you know somebody that will come and help deep that will also have some some freedom in the final third to both crash the box but also knit things together I I, I think for me I see his integration at, at wide I see his integration at wide to come inside um, and uh, I think that Miles is going to have a very similar introduction. I think youngsters in general, you introduce wide to limit the amount of mistakes that you'll see. And I think that uh, as the season goes, if he provides enough trust, then we'll get cameos in midfield. Mm. But I don't see this season his breakout midfield role. I see yeah. this as a, a, a master of, of none kind of thing. And uh, being fit in everywhere to gain experience. And then you're looking at almost the 2018, I believe it was, Saka, that wasn't exclusively left back. You know, he had moments in midfield and, you know, he had moments at left wing, at right mm -hmm. wing, but it wasn't the predominant switch. I don't think we see that um, yeah. from Ethan I think, or Miles I think yet. Also, we had a quote from Mikel recently on, I think it was Male Sport, who was talking about how he supposedly, I'm not sure it was a quote, but there was a sort of quite decent inside information that Mikel really thinks about and worries about the academy players and worries about sort of including them too early and, you know, rushing them into things or whatever. So I think your point around maybe keeping them more wide to reduce the, you know, the, maybe the cost of certain mistakes uh, is probably a good one. 
I wonder whether sort of towards the end of the season, I just, I don't know that the, the, what I was watching in preseason, maybe I'm just getting too excited too early, but there is something about that sort of that mid, uh, midfield three of Odegaard and Rice and Wanieri that, 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 that does interest me as a, to have a look, but I, I sort of take your point. Well, one I suppose thing it's, that I did it, look at, because it, because it, it will lead us into the central access point as a nice bridge. I thought, so we just finished the first half of the Manchester United match. And I mean, would you not say it's fair to say that we struggle to get central access from deep buildup as, as a yeah, whole? Yeah, I, I think it's less of a concern for me because of the profiles that were on the pitch in terms of Hein and Aiden Heaven and two... Uh, had sure, but like in Jenko the match in general, like Andrew one Jenko. of the stories of that half, Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. It's it's My point is more that I the extrapolation of what we need to do with that is more to do with me with the profiles. But I, I, I agree in terms of the story of the match. Yeah, yeah so so then I, I, I would say, think back to your Liverpool and look at Miles in terms of what he did in that deep build-up. That is going to be something that Miles can have an opportunity to come to the team for. This idea to receive and disguise passes between the lines. If you had a Miles in that Manchester United game, it jumps out at you. And I do think that players show you where you're strong and where you're your weekend and and i think the best thing that i saw with ethan was the ghosting and the, the assist right like it's a it's a highlight reel but the intelligence to make that selfless underlapping run and stay in the pocket and then create the space for yourself mm. for the cross that's what's important to me miles it's not important just because he's a big physical kind of dribbler and that's exciting no what was exciting for me was for him to show his passing range, for him to show his receiving and the disguise that he shows between the lines to really play and fire the ball through the lines and hit people inside. If you're a youngster, you need to solve what the team doesn't have in the moment. And that's how you get your opportunity. Yeah. doesn't mean that the team lacks it completely, but if you solve an issue within the team in the present moment, you give yourself an opportunity to have cameos. I still think both of them won't have a set position necessarily in the 11 for the next year to 18 months it's going to take that long in my opinion for them to be accustomed to and 17 first team. like obviously <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and but then after that point i do think they settle on a position and if you're mm. asking me where that is i do think it's in midfield i think miles might stay a little bit more deeper for a couple years longer than ethan will because i think ethan um his role it's either a winger that's basically a 10 or the 10 like they're very similar roles in terms of how you just orchestrate them. But mm -hmm. a left back, as opposed to maybe the Marino facilitative eight is a very different role. And yep. so you're, you're talking about less overlap in those roles, but ultimately mm -hmm. something that I think miles will look to. So, so yeah, you, it's, it was exciting. I loved seeing obviously a lot of hail end there, but I think um, I'm excited and hopeful that mm -hmm. I do think we actually see uh, a lot more hail end minutes generally yeah. speaking yeah and I, want, I want to come to that now you called him marina is everything all right i'm trying <laughs> uh <laughs> i'm trying i knew i see the comment i'm trying <laughs> um yeah so just on that then in, in terms of pathways i i wonder if you had to make a prediction now who do you think out of ethan and miles because they, they they feel like the two haylanders that are, are sort of closest to the first team who do you feel like is going to get the most minutes this season and where because i kind of take your point that it's like it's like about what what problems do you solve for the team and i wonder at some point in the in the season are we going to need a bit more carry from deep and someone like a miles makes perfect sense from a fullback position you know and maybe playing out there or you know are we going to need something out wide you know a little bit later on in the season with a one year so Arsenal going into this offseason needed to solve three major things for me. Their transitional inevitability, their left-hand side fluidity, and the build-up tempo. It was a big thing that I was looking at. I think we've bought the build-up tempo, and that's something that Miles addresses. But we've bought almost, what, 42 million pounds plus whatever it was with Reno is going to be maybe 25, so don't quote me, but I don't know. You're looking at 67 million pounds of addressing that and the left-hand side fluidity. Yeah. One thing that we haven't done is that transitional inevitability. Yeah. And part of that is making decisions in transition. And I think it's not to say that Miles doesn't have that, but he does that deeper. He does that getting yeah. you from the first phase into the second phase. And in theory, we've bought the solution. We haven't seen it, but in theory, we've bought it. So I think Ethan just has a better chance because yeah. um in general when we look at a sack of backup and i do i don't know if you want to transition to this topic right now but you know you have another experienced head 
that we both believe could have a very good opportunity of sample at right wing. Yeah. So when you but, combine that, Ethan has the best chance just because I think there's more demand for that type of player, especially against also mid blocks and low blocks. You're always going to ask for different solutions to unlock that. And I think from the back, Arsenal generally are quite secure. You know, yeah. like Miles has to get above Calafiore, the new signing for 42 million pounds, as well as Yuri and Timber. Mm. And yeah. arguably, Tom Yasu. Like, y- there's a lot of senior heads to get yeah. above there. Yeah. Yeah. Ethan, yeah. there's yeah. less so. Like, o- outside of Saka, you've got our shout of Gabriel Jesus. Um, Vieira, who's not convincing. So that role has doubt. And yeah. then the role of the left eight has had doubt all of last season. So we hope Marino is going to be the one to solve it, but it's not a given. Yeah. So there's more doubt higher up. Yeah, I think I think you makes sense. I think... Um... Yeah, I mean, let's let's come to that now because we we wanted to sort of talk, uh, no let, let's let's first talk about the, sort of the, the three things you mentioned there, which I think are really important in terms of the build up tempo, the central access, and the transition stuff. Because I agree, let's let's kind of part the transition stuff during this preseason. I don't think we've seen us um, change, but I think what we've seen is the is almost like the, the the same issues sort of coming up. And in theory, we know we, there was a moment in the rewatch right where. Zinchenko there's a moment where he can drive inside to sort of change that tempo and, and, and sort of change that structure and he, and he doesn't I think in theory the central access issue with a Calafiori and a Timber and a Marino who I think is more talented at receiving in the pocket than, uh, than people might think especially on that left hand side I, I feel like we've, we've we've kind of we've come onto that but you have this theory about the sort of the left hand side being the the jumpers and the right hand side being the controllers which I, I really really like I'd love you to, to say it yeah, so uh, I think generally speaking, one of the things that we bemoaned last season is bravery deep to find people early between the lines. And uh, I think we've recruited a lot of stuff to fix that. And we've got people back injured. Like we said, Yuri and Timber is brilliant at that. And part of it's just intent to really draw, turn, and force the play through the middle of the park. Uh, and you need quality to do that. So we've recruited the quality. Um, but if you have a look at the personality changes between both the left-hand side of the pitch and the right-hand side of the pitch, and I'd urge everybody to have a look at Gabriel, think about Calafiori, think about Marino, think about uh, Gabriel Martinelli. What would you describe their out-of-possession play to be like? If anything, it leans towards the spectrum of over-aggressive. And I think that we're going to call them, so to speak, the hunters in the press. We're going to see that side really slant and force play as much as we can to the right. Why? Because who's on the right? Saliba, Ben White, Martin Odegaard, Bakayo Saka. Both, uh, all of them are aggressive, but we would associate those as the calm heads, the ones with more controlled aggression. And I think the idea will be a lot more, while we have this buildup where we force play to one side, I think we're going to want to force to the right more often not just because we have more controlled aggression on that side, but also it's our more ball dominant side. So it's the side that we're going to want our high touch players to have the most touches in a match for. So I think we're going to lean towards that. I've seen instances in preseason for me, even as far back as the United game, but um, in other games where we have slightly seen a push towards that. Uh, I wonder if it becomes a full fledged plat- pattern, but I suspect the goal is let's force play to a particular area of the pitch because we want to control the narrative. It's not just so much that we're now covering space out of possession, but now we want to impose ourselves, right? So we want to use the press to our advantage, not just in terms of locking off options and markers, but we actually want to use it to get the ball and make breaks happen in areas we want it, not just where the opposition tell us to. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the left-hand side slanted thing, we've seen before, but I think it will take a big step up. I remember games like... um, was it Liverpool at home last season? We just felt like we were just fully, you know, at them down that side. I think even with Edison, we were trying to force him out to Ake in the home game last season. It feels like we sort of have had that that sort of uh, that bias anyway, and maybe we're trying to sort of step onto it a little bit more. Um, Arsenal were third from bottom. <laughs> have a guess how many switches we made in the Premier League according to FB Ref last season. Have a guess. Um, one a match. Let's do thirty-eight. <laughs> 65 but West Ham made the most with 158 Liverpool yeah. were second and interestingly Manchester City were third it's poor 
Yeah, I, I mean, you know, obviously there was the, the quote from Declan Rice talking about the, the switches in that athletic article that came out, talking about how Mikhail doesn't, you know, wants to use them for an advantage. You don't always Can I ask have, you a question about advantage. this? Go on, George. So, obviously, we'd like to see more switches. This isn't mm. groundbreaking stuff. And obviously, you're not watching this video saying, oh, you're telling me that there was more switches in preseason. Thank you for so showing something that I didn't see. I had a question about how do you feel about commentators talking about a weakness of a, of a game? And let's say that we don't see it in the season, but then you wait 12 months and your coach starts do, using it and doing it. How do you balance critique of a team and critique of a of a coach or person that you know absolutely knows more football than any of us could ever hope to be? How do you balance that? I think it, I think it's always about not assuming that something's happening for no reason or like the coach isn't across it. I think the, an example is like the left-hand side last year we're all making the, and you know, we, we had conversations about how, you know, how you fix the left-hand side doesn't feel like it's quite functioning. Mikel will know that. <laughs> so it's kind of, I think it's about reverse engineering. Okay. So why isn't that being addressed? Can it be addressed with the, the profiles we have? Are we, are we stuck? And that, that's the interest for me. There's like the, the sweet spot of analysis where you're kind of bridging the gap between what we do and what we don't know. I'm sure Mikel knows that Martinelli wasn't firing last season. He's got eyes. But it's like, okay, so, you know, the things that he isn't doing versus he is doing, and, you know, the conversations, I'm sure, you know, I, I, if you remember All or Nothing, they have those meetings post-game. It's like him, Mikel at the head of the table and then all the coaches. I'm sure those conversations are going on about that. But it's about balancing out, okay, but our right-hand side is functioning and if we do X, Y, and Z. And I think just the returns of the switches, it's clearly a decision. It's clearly a decision. So I think we, we are seeing more switches in preseason. But the more interesting question, I agree, is, is why and sort of what's what's made the the call. Is that going to continue? Is that something we are going to see as you know bump up next season? And if so, what what stopped us? You know, last season is it the receivers? Is it the players? Do we not trust Zinchenko to execute, execute them or Ben White? But we do trust the Califuri. You know what I mean? It's that's the sort of the sweet spot. I think I had a theory last know. season on a pod when we talked. I remember it in January. It's because of the loss of Timber and Partey. I look at now what you've recruited with Califiori and Marino. Mm. You've got a failsafe in the exact same mold of what a Timber and Partey gave you in the middle of the park out of possession. For me, it had less to do with the ability of us to physically switch or even for our receivers to receive and take it in the air. I actually think that we've got quite a few aerial targets, especially now we've recruited another one, Marino, mm. on the opposite side, and we've Best also got one in Kai Havertz. Um, yeah. So uh, I think we have them. My fear has always been out of possession in the press. Do we have the same legs and the horizontal agility to shift if it was lost? Mm. Not that we can't do it, but that if it was lost, do we sacrifice our press yeah. and our integrity in the middle of the park? Yeah. And I think without Timber and Partey last season, I don't think that Mikel trusted the available options to do it. Now, yeah. this season, I think he's making more of an effort to do it because not only do we have those players back, but also we've recruited more that can help in that regard yeah. as well. So even if they're not available, we always have one or two extra in the middle of the park that's not named Rice and Odegaard that can shift really easily pitch to pitch horizontally. And, and I think that's the reason. But again, yeah. that's my guess. So I don't sit on the no, fence and I will no, always I hear give that. you guys I hear, an opinion. <laughs> I think you're right. And if you look at, you know, I think we our counter pressing numbers were, were through the roof, but that implies that a lot of work is done on our positioning on the training ground yeah. to go, okay, yes, we're in possession here. But if we lost it, okay, we can clamp down on you, which tells you by logic that Mikel thinks a lot about that. So maybe he does. So I think, I think it's, it's good logic. He might feel if you go that far, you you can't get the bodies across over. And if you lose that duel, you've, you've, you've lost it, which which makes sense. I think adding the best duel winner in Europe is uh, is certainly going to have some kind of impact on uh, on switching. And also, we we have seen it with Ben White. So I don't, I don't really buy the argument that Ben White can't switch or doesn't switch. We had there was That's a game he did against, all his first season, it, mate. Yeah, it was against Fulham this season where he was playing balls out to Martinelli, and he can do it. So I don't, I don't think it's an execution thing. So yeah, we'll see, we'll see how that goes and see how that sort of develops over the course of the season. Finally, um, I want to come to Jesus because I, I, I think firstly the physical level ha has raised clearly. I think he spoke to. Uh, the Arsenal website and said he, he's feeling better. You know, I think he had a knee issues and had to have surgery last preseason, so he missed preseason and that sort of stuff. And he says he's feeling better. There's a lot of physical moments where I'm going, oh, okay. There's there's a there's a the Jesus that we know and love pre World Cup Jesus oh, is back. Um, but we we saw him out on the right hand side and we we like what we saw. I think what 
excites me about Jesus on the right-hand side is what it could mean because I think he has the 1v1 capacity. I think he's a much more of a give-and-go combiner in the way that you might associate with like an Emil Smith row than people give credit for to Jesus. I think he's brave. He, there was a moment in the United game where, which we watched where he like sort of tucks it out and pulls it back out of um, Harry Maguire and just like, it just like does, I don't know what you call it, but he like pulls it around. Reverse ran, Cruyff. <laughs> reverse Cruyff or something around the back of him, pulls it out of him, you know what I mean? Sort of pulls it r- around the back of him. And there's a, there's a bravery. And when he has got that physical burst, he's okay, he hasn't got the ball recycling. Uh, okay, he hasn't got maybe necessarily the, the retention, the physical capacity of Saka in terms of holding off a duel. But he does so much of what Saka can do that in terms of managing the minutes for Saka, Jesus is starting, especially other performances in preseason, you don't want to read too much into it, but he's starting to look more and more like my most favoured option out there. I think there's a while where I was going, is it Vieira? Is it Wanieri? Is it Jesus? But I feel like Jesus in this preseason has started to go, no, I think that is the option if, if, if Saka is out. Yeah, and, and um, I, I really don't know why people aren't more willing to see that. I mean, Jesus' best sample factually with Manchester City came with him primarily at right wing. I think arguably it's his best position. Yeah. Um, you know, look, for me, Jesus is a player that brings chaos. Arsenal at moments were predictable in the final third. We need a bit of chaos. It's about how do you platform that chaos and whether or not we can afford that to happen in the middle of the park with a central reference when we give so much freedom and demand on those central players to create structure. Mm. That's that's the issue for me. So yeah. when, when I look at it, he's always been somebody that I've preferred out wide for that reason, because of how we play and how we platform people in the middle of the park. So look, I'll keep it short. I think Jesus is somebody that um, has this bravery, but also this vertical intent that he wants to entertain. And at times, if you lose that in the middle of the park, you leave yourself open to transition. And I think that him on the wings gives us a lot of what we're asking for in terms of moments. I think he's one of our best dribblers and our best 1v1 players as well. And I think that he also gives us a level of unpredictability where on the wing, we can be quite predictable. If you really think about even last season, there were times not just at the left wing, but even at right wing, Saka will always receive wide and step and wait for support because he's always the highest player. Martinelli will always be touch line right winger and will always mm-hmm. recycle. There's a level of lane five just being occupied and not yeah. doubted yeah. ever. And, yeah. you know, there's moments that we can do it better, but I'd like to see lane five create doubt, not just the inside channels. And yeah. I think I that we that. can do that a little bit more with a Jesus as a touch line winger. And if you have a Jesus who, who, who can do, yeah, as you say, that, that where, where do you want that chaos? If you can isolate him out wide, you know that that could, that could lead to some some really favourable outcomes. Let's uh, let's finish there. Uh, as we say, you can go check out the full rewatch on uh, Patreon. Have we plugged it enough yet? I feel like we have. Um, but also, let us know how we can improve. It is the first time yeah. I've never really done a rewatch like that before. Yeah. So if you guys, it, we would love it. We would love for you guys to check it out. A like, comment, subscribe, do all that wonderful stuff. But if you do check it out on the Patreon, let us know what you guys think. And if you guys want us to rewatch in a different way, a different approach, just let us know. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, because it's uh, yeah, it's 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 difficult to know how whether you just want to leave the footage and commentate <laughs> over it or pause it and jump in. It's it's hard to know. So yeah, let us know. Uh, thanks as always. Thank you, George. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for being here. If you're watching us on YouTube, actually, this is the only place this is going. If you're watching us on YouTube, you are. Uh, please <laughs> like and subscribe. Uh, we'll be back for another main pod on Monday. I think Babs has got a live show coming out on Sunday. Don't know when you'll be watching this, but uh, there you go. Um, and yeah, the content machine keeps rolling on. Two weeks today, we start. Premier League. Christ. Uh, thanks as always for watching. Thanks for watching. No, what, what's the song? I keep forgetting the sign off. Um, Thank thanks for keeping it Arsenal. That's it. Ready? <clears throat> thanks for watching and thanks for keeping it Arsenal. What professional. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs>